Hi there, and welcome to open class number 73. Um, hope you're doing really well. Uh, I'm excited about a couple of really good questions here from four people. And um, what else? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was something I want to share, which uh, is is actually, I, I'm going to officially, let me kind of officially announce this with, with Coach Michael on um on Friday, we'll do a little bit of a bigger deal about this, but <laughs> well, I just want to share that, uh, you know, me and Michael have been talking and we have realized that um, that for most people, for, the, for, for most people, it seems like one-on-one -on -one coaching is better than group coaching. There's a lot of good things with group coaching. You can get support from others in the same community, but for, most people prefer the one-on-one. -on -one. So, what we've done is that we reduced the price for our um, self-coaching master program, which is our group coaching uh, option here on the Sleep Coach School, quite a lot. It's uh, uh, it was two fifty, now it's eighty nine. So big, big uh, shift there because we think actually one on one coaching is what most people need, and uh, so we just want to share that in case you are interested. I think I think the self-coaching master program, the group coaching option, is really good if you are at a a place where you just want to learn you're not too anxious or too worried uh, but you may have some trouble sleeping but you just really want to learn and and talk to others who are on the same path etc i think is a perfect option uh but yeah just want to share this so with that said let's jump in and and take a look at some questions here i'm going to share my screen here it is questions and the first one is from first question for today is from lara let's read this Greetings. I was watching your videos and I got a bit worried. Maybe I have SFI. I noticed that I started feeling extremely tired during the day. I got confused about where or who I am. Where did I put something like depersonalization, derealization? My awareness also started when I noticed that my sleep changed. Usually I was sleeping normal with all kinds of dreams, eight hours, but after a lot of effort to fall asleep, now when I lay down, I feel like I'm going down in a big black hole and I wake up confused and my confusion is following me during the whole day. I also have nights when I, uh, after a lot of effort, I sleep little in the morning, same feeling. I have feeling I lost my dreams. I don't remember anything, how or when I fall asleep. Every night is like that. I'm really scared because during the day, I have a feeling that I'm not sure anymore what is real and what is not or who I am. I have problems with memory. I have a feeling that every day I am going more and more in that confusion fusion between reality and dream. I also noticed that some pictures like a memory came in my head not knowing uh, was it from a dream or reality. I also have noticed the trouble with walking. It's like more heavy. I also have apathy. Everyone noticed uh, that something seems to have changed from a happy person to an unhappy person with zero interest for everything. Could it be SFI? The weird feeling started before a month ago, but it, it got worse the last 15 days with extreme sleep disturbance. Thank you for your answer. Lara, um, sorry to hear this, and um, uh, and but, but thank you for reaching out and sharing sharing this. Uh, I want to say uh, that nothing on this channel is ever medical advice. Anyone that is concerned about their health, talk to your doctor. Um, you know. So my general thoughts when I hear a message like this is that um, you know, SFI, if you want to learn about SFI, then check out this. Um, video where I talked to Casper, whose mom passed away from SFI, it becomes very clear, very clear when, when you talk to Casper that uh, SFI has nothing to do with what we call insomnia. Insomnia is when you are worried, you're anxious, you're wondering what's going on, things are strange and confusing, you struggle with sleep, that's insomnia. And SFI is nothing like that. It is really a neurological thing. It's like obvious to people that there's something neurologically wrong with you. And uh, so yes, so that's the first thing I want to say. If somebody can, if somebody can kind of recognize their symptoms, they can self-monitor, they can think about what's going on, they can write an email, they can write to me, that's not SFI. But that said, uh, what Lara describes here in this message is very, very common. Depersonalization, things are bizarre, strange, sleep isn't happening, you know, you all kinds of things can happen when you have this hyper arousal, this alertness, this kind of like your brain is in this monitoring mode. And if you combine that with like little sleep, you have this kind of part of your body's tired, it's fatigued, it's confused, it's wondering, it's trying to figure it out, it's getting entangled, all kinds of things, weird things can happen. 
you can check out Insomnia Insight number 322, where I talk more about hyperarousal and all the things that it can cause, like twitches and tensions and um, um, being afraid of falling asleep, being afraid of unconsciousness, like visual disturbances, you know, memory problems, not, not recalling the name of common objects, tinnitus, uh, you know, um, balance issues, like it can cause all kinds of things. So that's, you know, the, my big thing when I read this, Laura, is that nothing strange or unusual in this message uh, is things that you, if you, if you look through open classes or you check the comment section, you'll find these things described often. So I think uh, uh, hopefully this will be helpful and you'll learn a little bit more and, uh, and you'll see that um, uh, what you learn here will be really helpful to you. So hang in there, Laura, and let us know how things go. Okay, so let's jump ahead to Guy. Let's read this. This is Guy from the UK. Uh, let's read this. Hello, I'm writing to you from London, UK. My name is Guy. I've been slowly working my way through Set It and Forget It after watching a few of your videos and listening to a few of your podcasts. Last year, I read a pair of CVT books on insomnia and also Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep. But I found that doing sleep diaries and focusing on my inability to sleep hasn't been beneficial. And reading about the cancer and heart disease, the Walker book, while unable to drift off is definitely not helpful. I remember struggling to get to sleep on Sunday nights as a kid. And my wife tells me I've had intermittent problems uh, with sleep for the last 10 years or so. I had problems with waking up at four or five last year and in 2019. But since late last year, my main issue has been finding myself unable to sleep in the first instance. This is new for me and I don't know what to do. I found myself feeling out of control and angry after a sleepless night even though I know I can still do my job, be a parent and do the things I need to do each day. I'm talking to a therapist every couple of weeks. I'm actually a therapist myself. I'm struggling to make sense of my experience and feel that even though I meditate and consider myself a fairly relaxed person, sleeplessness is something that I can't quite figure out. Last night, I didn't sleep at all, even though yesterday was my birthday and today I didn't have a hectic workload. I didn't get out of bed until about 4 a.m. this morning and tried watching a movie to take my mind off how restless I felt, but ultimately went back to bed and didn't sleep at all. This all feels a bit strange to be sharing with somebody, and I don't know how much useful information there is here, but if you'd like to answer my any question, any specific questions, I'd be really happy to do so. Not only would I like to be able to improve my attitude towards sleep, I'd like to be able to support my therapy clients should they present with sleep problems regards guy. Absolutely, guy. Yeah, there was a lot here that I think... Uh, is very important and um, that we should talk about. And actually, I want to start here. Uh, it's it's co by coincidence. I actually uh, I have I, I do, most of the coaching I do uh, is uh, my through my app called Bedtime with a Y. And I have these. Um, there there are a lot of questions that that um, are recurrent. So I have some uh, you know some answers to that that I have saved. And one, I, I just today created a new kind of like uh, standard answer, like a pre-formulated answer. And it was an answer to someone who has uh, worked with me maybe like six, no, yeah, maybe like six weeks or something like that. And who clearly understands the teaching very, very well. And what I wrote in this answer was that certain things actually make, certain things that are actually that seem to be good can actually work against you very surprisingly. And these are what I wrote in this answer was, if you are a therapist, a licensed counselor, a psychologist, a yoga instructor, someone who's done meditation for many years, or someone who just has really studied and completely understands the teaching on this channel. Now, how could that, that how could those things not be helpful? Like understanding the mind, you know, having like that detachment that comes from meditation, the acceptance approach, shouldn't that all be good? Well, the thing is that all those things can actually lead you to feel more pressured to be successful, i.e. to sleep more, you know? I've had many clients who have been uh, counselors and have had this extra layer of pressure because they feel like I should get this, I should be able to figure this out, I should be doing better. And that extra layer of kind of like self-judgment and like, you know, being hard on yourself often keeps you stuck for longer than, you know, you would otherwise. So the first thing I want to say there is that 
there, you know, once you're a little bit kinder to yourself and you, you think you, you, you maybe talk to yourself in terms of like sleep, it really is not taught to anyone, you know, even if you are, you understand the principles of yoga, not just the asanas, but the whole thing, or you, uh, you, you meditate or you, you fully understand everything or you're a therapist or things like that, you know, uh, you know, oftentimes there's still like sleep is about letting go and the more you feel like you should get this that extra layer of like judgment if you will just is is often can get you stuck so first thing i want to say is just deploy a lot of self-kindness you know the more you the more you just talk to yourself and like okay uh sleep didn't happen that time and that's okay i'm not going to blame myself for that i'm not going to be hard on myself for that like that self-kindness is so 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 very important which now lead this kind of segue into something I really want to talk about, which is the illusion of failure. What's this? What's this about? Well, oftentimes, when you know, in, in, in normal, in generally in life, when we are unable to do something that we want to do, we think of it as a failure. We kind of didn't, we weren't able to that. We, we get frustrated. Now, here's the thing that sleep is something no human being has any 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 uh control over it is actually a completely passive process it happens when we deploy zero effort so nobody can control their sleep and frustration really comes from that feeling of like i was unable to do that and we kind of put this together when you see that okay nobody can control their sleep and i'm being hard on myself for not being able to control it, then you see that this is a total illusion. The, that I that, that I was unable to sleep is a total illusion. It's 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 not real. It it just doesn't actually make sense. And then you see like I'm hard on myself for doing something that's really an illusion that nobody can do. That that I think really eases the way towards like being kind to of yourself. So I think that that was maybe actually the most important here. But um, now. What, what can be really confusing with insomnia is that uh, it is driven by hyperarousal. Let's write this down. Hyperarousal can come from many places. This is super important, okay? Hyperarousal, I'm sure, Guy, you're very familiar with this, but for anyone else out there, hyperarousal is basically a heightened state of alertness when um, you are, it's basically a kind of anticipatory state of something is about to happen and I better watch out, you know? You hear things, you see things very clearly, you're very alert, attentive, you know? And classically, this come, like the most common reason for hyperarousal is, is anxiety, but it can come from many other places. For example, anger or frustration. You know, when you're angry, you're hyper aroused and that can keep sleep from happening. So again, another reason to be kind to yourself. But also, hyperarousal very commonly comes from puzzlement and confusion, and like, and like, in like, I can't figure it out, you know. And this is so sneaky because oftentimes, like, I just wonder why I'm not sleeping, and that is it. Wondering why you're not sleeping, that is enough to make you hyperarousal so that you don't sleep. You know, wondering is something that keeps you preoccupied, etc., and that keeps sleep from happening. So that's something else that we read about here from Guy that uh, is often very hard to quote unquote figure out because, you know, you know, just wondering, it's, it's very hard to see. Like the way I like it to put it is like, it's solving a problem is difficult when problem solving is, a, is the problem you're trying to solve, you know? It is very tricky that way. And, and this is one of those where like, I just wonder why I don't sleep. Well, that is the reason you're not sleeping, okay? So that was another one I want, I want to talk about that's important. And then I also want to talk about this one, forecasting failure. So the thing is that there are some things in life that are, um, that, are that can be predicted. For example, the weather. You know, if you have a lot of data, you have satellites, you have all these kinds of things, then you can actually, with pretty good accuracy, uh, predict what the weather is going to be like. And the reason you can do that is that the weather, what happens is completely detached from your prediction. You know, whether you predict it's gonna snow or not tomorrow, that is not gonna impact whether it snows or not at all. But sleep is not like that. It is not like that at all. 
our prediction of whether we'll sleep or not has a very big and completely, uh, completely like, uh, I want to use another word than predictable, but I, I can't find another one. So predicting it has a completely unpredictable effect. So an example I like to use is this one. Let's say somebody says, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that I'm going to sleep tonight. But nobody can be 100% sure, right? So let's say this person is like 99%, I'm like 99% sure I'm going to sleep by 11 p.m. But guess what? That prediction creates some, some pressure there, some pressure. So just predicting it actually probably takes it down to like 99.95%. But guess what? When it is like 10.49 and this person is not feeling sleepy, then suddenly, whoa, that prediction doesn't seem right. It's probably just 87%. And then five minutes later, it's like 50%. And then at 11, it's like zero because that person didn't sleep. So you can see like now there's no sleep at all. Like, or that's what the, that's what the new prediction is. Now that this person is like, wow, that's it. I didn't fall asleep at 11 as I predicted. I'm probably going to be up all night. So now the new prediction becomes the, the likelihood of sleep is 0%. And what happens then, bizarrely, is now there is absolutely no pressure to sleep. And then you know, sleep comes easier. And then suddenly the prediction becomes 84%. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that uh, when you've had a very relaxing day and it was your birthday and it was great, then you might be like, oh, I'm probably going to sleep tonight. But again, that prediction can take you in any kinds of places. It can make predicting make sleep completely unpredictable. So, um, so those were some important things. And, uh, and another one is, um, uh, you know, when somebody has had a lot of trouble maybe waking up early and then starts having trouble like falling asleep, uh, you know, it takes long to fall asleep, super common. And, you know, the thing with that is that there's no mysteries when it comes to insomnia, it's gas and break. If you're, very, if you're really sleepy, your body really needs sleep and you're not hyper aroused, sleep will happen. Insomnia is really a, a break issue, if you will. It has to do with hyperarousal, and that can happen in the morning or in the evening or middle of the night. Like whenever you're, whenever you are afraid of being awake, that's when you are going to have trouble sleeping. So uh, it's very common that the fear of being awake at night shifts from this to that, and it's 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 very very common. It's the, if you had trouble staying asleep and now you're trouble falling asleep, very very common. Nothing strange or unusual with that at all. And the key is always to befriend wakefulness, to go to a place where you're like, okay, uh, if I don't sleep much tonight, uh, or, or this, if I'm awake now, like that's okay, I'm gonna be okay with being awake, I'm gonna befriend it, I'm not gonna try to make myself sleep. That is a very good way. And by the way, guy, you've seen that you function well during the day, even if you sleep little, that's good, that's some pressure off, so, uh, but you get a little bit angry and things like that. So go towards self-kindness. I hope uh, the content of this, uh, video is helpful to you. And, um, and if there are any follow questions, please, please be back. Okay. All right. So with that said, we will, um, continue here with, uh, actually I bet, I think this is the same Clara, but so we'll just say there's two messages from Clara. Uh, Clara says, how do I stop feeling jealousy for those who can sleep properly? And then sleeping only a few hours negatively affects all the things that I should be able to do the next day. For example, studying also, I'm into weightlifting. And when I wake up in the middle of the night and can't fall back asleep, I can't stop thinking about how I won't be able to do what I love because of the lack of sleep. I'm too tired. I just can't lift weights the way I'm used to. And if I don't sleep enough, then my muscles won't recover properly. And this leads me to a cycle of excessive worrying about sleep, which only makes things worse. Not being able to do what I love is my fear, which creates anxiety. And therefore, I only sleep a few hours per night. Physical activity is one of the things that is keeping me going through these rough times. How can I get out of the cycle if not sleeping enough actually affects what I love to do? A lot of really important things here. And um, uh, where should we start? I think, let's, so let's start with the first one. I can't stop feeling jealousy for those who, who can sleep properly. The first thing I wanna say there is the, you know, the word properly. The word properly here indicates that there is some type of like right or wrong. That person can sleep. I cannot sleep. This is how much you should sleep. And I can't do that. And in reality, like again, sleep is passive. Nobody has any control over it. So who's to say, who's to say what is proper, not proper. I mean, I'm just going to, the, the, the where I'm going with this is to say that the more you think in terms of like 
again, kind of being hard on yourself and expecting yourself to be able to sleep, uh, that, that will keep you from sleeping. So if you think like that person can sleep and I cannot, that is another illusion. Actually, let's talk about this one. This is called the illusion of control, controllability. So, you know, the brain is a problem solving machine. It's, kind of, it's always there to keep us safe, safe from harm. And when you have trouble sleeping, of course, it goes into like a problem solving mode. And it is, it is very attractive for the brain to, to think, to believe that you can control sleep because then it becomes more clear. Like if I can just figure out how to control it, then uh, I can fix this problem. So the brain often goes into like, okay, what did I do before? And how about other people? And then it concludes that in the past, I had some control and now I lost control or other people still have control, but I've lost that control, which is a complete illusion actually, because if you ask somebody who sleeps really well, what the secret is, they will give you the secret. They will go like, I don't know. And that, and that is it. Like the lack of any effort is what leads to sleeping well. So, when you're jealous of somebody who's sleeping well, the you know you're sort of je jealous at somebody because they're not doing anything. Like that jealousy comes from, you know, sort of not being able to not do anything. It's it kind of doesn't make sense in a way. Like of course I'm not saying being jealous doesn't make sense. Sleep envy is very very common, but I think the most important thing really is to look at why that pe person is sleeping well and see that, oh, that comes from nothing, that comes from not trying, and that can really set you off to her sleeping well. And, and the, the last thing on that topic is, we have no, again, in, on the topic of illusion of controllability, we have, we humans have zero control, direct control over emotions. So if you're feeling jealous, and you, and you tell yourself, that's wrong, I shouldn't feel jealous, why am I feeling jealous, why can't I feel in a different way, then that is gonna get sticky, you know, because your brain is trying to kind of convey something, convey a message with your jealousy. And when you're like, I don't want to hear that message, then it gets more sticky. Then you become more and more jealous. So paradoxically, the, the way to feeling feeling less jealous is actually to be uh, self-kind again and to listen to the jealousy and be like, okay, I understand that I'm jealous. I know where that jealousy comes from. It just comes from you, brain, trying to keep myself safe. And I'm going to allow myself to feel jealous. And, and that shows the brain that you're listening. And then the jealousy will fade away. Now, we had, I wish I could, I wish I could remember his name. I think he had like a Thai, Thai sounding name. What was his name? I can't remember his name. But there was somebody who was quite active on the channel here who was actually a weightlifter, a competitive weightlifter who had insomnia. And um, something that, a very, a very common thread among most people that have trouble sleeping is this. It's like you're a type A person. You are a goal achiever. You are somebody who... Um, who is uh, goal oriented, you know, and you like to have control over things. And that is in general, that, 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 that is something that often helps you achieve things, but when it comes to sleep, it, it often does not help. But what he, what he noticed was that he, his performance actually was pretty good, even when he had a sleepless nights, you know? And um, if you, maybe you can, that, that could be something to explore, like really try to get some objective data on how, like, I, I think tracking is never good. I wouldn't say you track sleep. That, that's never helpful at all. But just like when you feel like I didn't sleep much tonight, and then you kind of like take measurements of how, how, how well you did weightlifting, I bet you would find that your performance actually was not, uh, not that affected, not as effective as you may think. We had another person on this channel who literally sleep slept zero hours her name is was it Brittany I think it was Brittany she slept zero hours the night before an Ironman triathlon which is totally brutal she completed it she did well and I was so happy for her because she had just showed that you can do well even after literally zero sleep so and that is a common thread on this channel a lot of people find that they they can actually do much better during the day than they they, they think they do but if you don't, if you find that, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I actually, when I sleep a little, I, I, my weightlifting is less. Well, then it's very important to think about this like secondary outcome. So when you have trouble sleeping, you of course want to, let's actually write this down. Uh, we're going we, to talk about secondary attachment.
Okay. So the primary attachment uh, is really, when it comes to insomnia, is to sleep itself. You, of course, want to sleep well just because, you know, that's, if you didn't have that, if you didn't have that attachment to sleep, like if you didn't, if you didn't have a desire to sleep, you, you wouldn't have insomnia, right? The insomnia, having insomnia is driven by that attachment, that desire for sleep, if you will. But oftentimes there's these second attach, secondary attachments, which is like, I, I want to sleep a certain amount so that um, my skin color is better or so I don't have these baggy eyes or, or so I can do better at work or, or this and that. And it's very natural, understandable why that happens, of course, but we have to keep in mind that anything that makes you pressured to sleep will make you sleep less. So when you not only would like to sleep better for the sake of sleeping better, but you also want to sleep more so that you can perform better weightlifting wise so that you can do the things you enjoy during the day, you are really uh, putting more pressure on yourself to sleep. So if you find that, yeah, I'm not doing so well when I don't sleep, then the, the best thing to do is to, to, to just note that and don't judge yourself. Be like, okay, um, I, I, I'm not going to be hard on myself for that. I understand where that comes from. And when this secondary attachment becomes a little bit loosened, when it's like, okay, I, I, I'm okay with not functioning as well if I sleep little, I, I'm, I'm not going to pressure myself. Then paradoxically, that's when, when the pressure is off, you sleep better and then you can perform well again. So this loosening up the secondary attachment is a very, very good uh, part, uh, very, very helpful way of, of sleeping better. Um, Oh, it's the same thing with this one. I cannot stop thinking about how I won't be able to do what I love. You know, um, thoughts are by nature fleeting. Thoughts just come and go because they're just kind of signals from the brain. But it is when we try to stop a thought, that's when it becomes really sticky. Uh, I would like to say it's like um, you can't, the reason you can't shut off, no, the reason your brain doesn't shut off is because you're looking for the switch. You know, when you're looking for the switch, how can I turn my brain off? That's when it gets really, really uh, intense in there. But when you're like, okay, this thought happened, I'm just going to uh, take note of this thought and I'm not going to try to push it away. Then thoughts become they then then thoughts become like fleeting again. Uh, if I'm if I'm too tired, I just can't lift weights, and that's another part of like where it's it's so important to deploy kindness to yourself. It, you just take a look at this like the difference between I'm tired or like I'm really tired and I'm too tired. I'm really tired is just objective. It's just like I'm really tired. It it's there's no there's no judgment in it. There's no there's no uh, call. There's no. Um, it doesn't call for any action. But I'm too tired. Just that little word. I'm too tired. It indicates that something is wrong. I shouldn't feel this way, and I need to do something so I don't feel this way. Which calls for all this action and attention and judgment and self and being hard on yourself. So, you know, if you're tired, then be like, I'm tired, and that's all right. I'm not going to judge myself for being tired. And when you're gentle with yourself, and you go the kind way with with no pressure. Things get really a lot of a lot of um, of uh, uh, things get better. And same thing here. It leads to a cycle of excessive worrying. Like, take a look at that. The the, the difference between I worry a whole lot and I worry excessively. Excessively indicates that you think it's wrong to worry like the, this much. You kind of harden yourself again. But if you just say I worry a lot without any judgment things get much, much easier. So um, I think I think those were the most important ones I, I could think about here. Uh, and I hope that helped. And if there's any follow-up, please let us know. Okay, so let's go over to the last one here from Sophia. I'm a college student and I recently have been struggling with insomnia, but with mine, I'm able to fall asleep at night, but I wake up between six and 7 a.m. every morning, no matter what time I go to sleep. This doesn't sound that bad, but it's actually getting in the way of my schoolwork because I'm so tired. I go to bed around 11, 30, 12 every night, and I get around six, seven hours. I've learned I need at least eight hours of sleep. This has been going on for three weeks now. I've been tracking my sleep. Usually what happens is around 10 or 11 a.m. I fall back asleep for another hour or two. For a whole week, I tried not napping, but I still ended up going to sleep at the same time, waking up too early. Since this has been happening, I've been researching what caused this. And I can only think of a few things. First of all, my mother has insomnia, but with hers, uh, she wakes up at 4 a.m. every morning. She said this has started happening to her when she was little, a little older than me. 
Second of all, for all my winter break, I worked at Amazon and I woke up 6 a.m. every day. But it's bizarre because my body always bounces back fast to waking up later. Again, I'm sure this isn't the most extreme case you've ever heard of, but I really want my body to be able to sleep until at least 9 a.m. I don't know why my body has been on this weird rhythm, but it's been really frustrating. If you took time out of your day to read this, thank you so much. Of course, of course, <laughs> I want to read this and answer Sophia. So I want to say this, that um, uh, I think anyone's struggle is is real, you know? There's no, um, you know, no no dismissing what anybody's going through and and you're right like you know what you what you're describing here is it, it has not had that huge impact on someone's life that a lot of the stories read about but it's very important nonetheless because i think you are sophia what i read here is someone who is kind of like flirting with insomnia in a way you know it is someone who has like if you think about someone who has really really a lot of struggle with sleep that person is in a state of fear their brain is really trying to problem solve and and it is that it is the attention the problem solving the trying to figure it out that is what drives insomnia and causes more pro problem solving that causes more insomnia and now you have this loop and if that cycle has been going on for many many years it can be really difficult to like take sleep off of the radar and to be and to have no fear and, and and not worry about it. It can be a lot of work. And in your case, Sophia, this is recent. This has only happened for a little bit of time. But we see, I just hear those things in this message that I hear from people who have had trouble sleeping for a long time when they talk about how it started. You know, they people talk about like, it was this period I didn't sleep much. And then this happened. And then start, I started paying attention and I started trying this and I tried that. And the more I tried, the less I slept. Then I tried more than and et cetera. So I'm like, I I think it is so important at this point to be like having this, you know, to to actually take steps away from trying, you know. Uh, you know, you have a goal to sleep until 9 a.m. And that's understandable, you know, you you of course want to sleep well. Everything you do comes from a place where you want to, you know, feel well. But whenever we have goals, whenever you have a goal, like especially like this hour goal, I want to sleep until this hour or this many hours, that is so unhelpful when it comes to sleep. Because having those number goals, they will lead to monitoring. They will lead to you wanting to track your sleep. They will lead to you looking to see how successful you were with this intervention or not with that intervention. It will lead you to want to know how many hours you slept or didn't sleep, you know, and that in, in, in sleep, sleep is, is like a, it's like a succulent plant. Like if you give it just a little bit of attention or even zero attention, that's when it does well. But if you treat it like a bonsai tree, if you try to trim it and fix it, then, then things become really, really tricky. So I think certainly there's so many, there's so much low hanging fruit here, Sophia. If you just like, okay, stop tracking sleep if you if you stop tracking sleep if you um set an alarm at some point during the morning when you want to get up but before that you just don't know what time it is and when you're awake you do something you like to do and if you're sleeping you're sleeping and, and you have no goals you just abandon the goals you know then sleep can come to you you know when you're it's sort of like somebody had a nice analogy and she said it was basically like Imagine if you were invited to a party and uh, somebody just, you know, the party was tonight and somebody called you like, are you coming? And texting like, why aren't you here? Like, aren't you going to come soon? Like, well, what's going on? Would you feel like like going to that party? Probably not because you're feeling like pressured. It's the same thing with sleep. It's like, why am I sleeping? You know, it's like sleep happens with less attention and less pressure and less monitoring and all that. So I think that is always the way to go. And I think for you, Sophia, it's such so important because I feel like you're, you are close to starting to have more trouble sleeping. And for anyone like your mom, she wakes up at 4 a.m. I don't think when somebody says like my mom has had trouble sleeping or my dad or my sister, to me that signals that in, in you know, we, we inherit a lot from our parents. 
Insomnia is not something you can inherit, but you can have the same approach to things, like the same kind of tendencies. Maybe, maybe your mom is a problem solver. Maybe she's a high achiever. Maybe she's a type A person. Maybe she's somebody that has a tendency to worry or things of that nature. And we can inherit that. Uh, but insomnia is always the same. You know, if if your mom or anyone else that has trouble sleeping uh, just learns about it and tries less. And for your mom, she, for example, wakes up at 4 a.m. If she didn't know what time it was, if she abandoned any attempts to control, if she befriended wakefulness, I'm sure she, like everyone else, would do well. There's nothing at all that predicts that you will have insomnia because your mom had it. Not at all. It just tells you that maybe you have some traits that are similar with some of your family members. All right, so that was our last question. That was from uh, from our forum on our website. But somebody's here with us live. It's Michael. The less I critique my sleeping over the last six months, the better I've slept. Much of this thanks to watching this channel. I, I, thanks so much for, for sharing this, Michael. And I cannot get over how important this is, like, um, like being critical and, like, having pressure. Like, I, sh I should, I should be able to do this why can't i do this i'm too much of this etc that that is very 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 much what keeps us stuck so thank you so much michael and thanks everyone for tuning in um if anyone is interested in some coaching one-on-one -on -one, then check out bedtime on your app store that's our i coach and if you on the other hand you know you're not particularly anxious you just want to learn about sleep and kind of a group in group setting, learn from others, check out the Self Coaching Master Program at thesleepcoachschool.com. And that's also where you can leave questions for open class. That said, I want to thank everyone, and I'll be back soon. Until then.